Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the cake and congratulations. That was wonderful. Um, <laughs> today we're going to be in um, the the two chapters of our book, or five and six. If um, if you haven't read those, I recommend you do because I don't always go in and pull things out of the book, but the book is there so that you can read and study ahead of time and get a better understanding of of what we're talking about. It might even give you the answers to the questions I ask, which makes you look really smart on the camera when you know the answers. So that gives you a heads up. But today we're going to continue with what we spoke about last week, and that is Paul's thesis statement, or his this is statement for the book. This is what he's trying to communicate to the Romans. And his thesis statement was that man needs God's righteousness, because he has none of his own. And the verse that we looked at was Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. And he said, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And we talked about why this particular verse, Verse or verses, this concept might be hard for some people to accept because their argument may be, well, what about the Pope? He's a pretty holy guy, you know, or what about, what, <laughs> see some dissent in the crowd here. <laughs> what about Mother Teresa? What about the monks that spend all their life chanting and praying? What about all the people that do good and give money to the poor? What about the Salvation Army? What about all... What about you? What about me? People like to think that they're pretty good. And for someone to come along and say, there's none good, including the Pope and Mother Teresa and all the rest. There's none that seeks after God. Whoa, that's a pretty big statement. Including what? Including us. That would include everybody. They have altogether become unprofitable. There's none that do good, no, not one. So how does Paul justify this kind of a blanket statement that he is saying that God looks down on the world and he doesn't see people doing good? He's, he sees people doing bad. The problem is our form of measurement. Because when people say this person's good or that person is righteous, they're measuring against it other people, right? Themselves or other people they think are good. And it's always amazing to me that people will point fingers at other people are being bad, but most people give themselves a pretty high mark. <laughs> Man, you ever notice that? And you say, hey, you know... You're going to go to heaven. You're going to stand before God. What are you going to say? I'll say I'm sorry. Sorry? <laughs> I'm sorry. I blew it. I'm sorry. Well, most people would say, yeah, I'm pretty good. I mean, I don't kick my dog. I pay my taxes, usually. I'm fairly honest. Um, you know, I... You know. Yeah, that's what gets us in trouble. You know, but they're comparing it to other people. I, I like to tell the story of Dr. McGee, who was was a mentor of mine on the radio. He had a program called uh, Through the Bible Radio. And I used to listen to him, still do, regularly. He's gone since 1980s, but everything is still on the program, is still going on the radio. But he used to tell a story called Jumping to Catalina. You may have heard me tell this story before, but if you haven't, it's a good story because off the coast of California, as you know, there's a beautiful island called Catalina Island. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, most of you, a lot of you have. It's beautiful. It's really cool because you go across the bay or across the ocean there, and it's almost like you're in a different country. I mean, it's, it's like you're in Europe, the way it, it's just beautiful out there on this island. But <laughs> the way you get there is you have to leave a pier from a boat or leave on a boat from a pier, and you go across the ocean, and you get there. Well, we're going to play a game called Jumping to Catalina, where you don't take a boat. You're actually going to run down the pier, and you're going to jump off the end of the pier and see how far you get. And so one person might run, 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 jump, and get 12 feet off the end of the pier. Another person you need might... need a higher pier. <laughs> need a higher pier. <laughs> you need know, a longer pier. 
So another person might run, and they're going to run and jump, and they might make 16 feet off the pier. Oh, they're better than the first guy. And they might go, oh, I'm better than that guy. And Marvin, he's going to run, he jumps, he makes it. Any guess? <laughs> Two feet off the pier. <laughs> 20 feet off the pier. I hear 20 feet off the pier. <laughs> I go play. It's like skipping rocks. You know? <laughs> he might make it 20. So Marvin's doing better than everybody else. And the temptation might be, well, I'm, I'm a lot farther toward Catalina than you are. But did any of them make it to Catalina? Not a one. Catalina's way <laughs> out there. So if our goal is just to be better than the guy next to us, many of us are doing okay. But if our goal is to make it to Catalina, none of us get there. God's standards are like making it to Catalina. And the problem is, for us, when God looks down on the world, he doesn't see this person better than this person and better than this person. He sees how are they measuring up to my holiness and my righteousness. And Paul says, none of us measure up. And that's his thesis. He's going to give us some evidence. Okay, Paul, do you have any evidence to support this claim that there are none that do good, none righteous, none profitable. God looks down and sees us all corrupt and worthy of going to hell, really. All right, so let's see what Paul says. Well, first of all, Paul in the book of Romans, says man is declared a sinner by historical evidence. So Paul says, look, here's the evidence for my thesis, and, and we're all going to be the judge in the end of whether or not he proves his, his thesis and gets his master's or doctorate in theology here. Paul says man is declared a sinner by historical evidence. Now, Where's that historical evidence found? It's found in the scriptures, and here's what he says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the first thing that Paul offers as evidence is, let's look at the record. How is man doing when we look at the history of man on the earth as recorded by the word of God, which is truth? Now the word is, when it says the wrath of God is revealed, actually means it's been revealed in the past, it's being revealed in the present, and it will be revealed in the future. That God is consistently against the unrighteousness of men. So how has God revealed his wrath in the past? Against God, uh, unrighteousness of man. What, what are some of the things that we can point to, that, or Paul could point to, and say, look, okay, here's how God has revealed his wrath. If man is not good and God judges sin, then there should be some judgment revealed against man. What is some? Anybody have any ideas? There's a few. There's a few. Let's name <laughs> some. The flood. Okay, Noah's flood. All right, Noah's flood. Certainly an evidence against God's wrath against sinful man. In fact, the Bible says there was only eight souls that were willing to believe God. How many people do you think were on the earth at the time of the flood? Quite a few. Quite a few. Probably in the millions. Because if you map it out, I mean, Adam lived 900 years. That's what? How many generations is that if a generation is every 20 years you can have a child? You know, so he's 20 years old, has a child. Yeah, a lot of begatting going on. A lot of begatting going on. And I think if you map it out, factoring um, for disease and other things, and that's only... And factoring in, only one person has a child every generation, and that person has a child, and that person has a child, and then you have to cut it in half because there's two people having one child. It's like 8 million people on the earth, something like that. And the, by the time Adam died, and now Adam lived 900 years, and then Methuselah lived after that another 900 years, and then after that, the flood came. So we're talking millions of people on the earth. And after all that time, only eight people God saved. Not a good track record for the human race, I would say. What other areas has God revealed his wrath against all unrighteousness? The plague. The what? Plague. Well, oh, the plagues on Egypt. Yeah. Plagues on the gods of Egypt and the idolatry of Egypt, absolutely. 
How about before the flood? Did God do anything back then? That was after the flood. What was what was the remark? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Fred says Sodom and Gomorrah. That was after the flood, but another revelation of God's wrath against unrighteousness. What happened to the first two people that were created? Is that what you were going to say, Jackie? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Look what happened to Adam and Eve. Beautiful place they could live in. They disobeyed God. God cursed the ground. God threw them out. So the wrath of God has been revealed over and over and over again against man's behavior. And no matter what age you look at, there's going to be some revelation of God's wrath against sin. So, yeah, God has revealed it. How about in the present? Is God revealing his wrath in the present age? When the age in which we live, you think? Fred, Fred, Fred's kind of giggling over here. Yeah, I think you'd say, yeah. Here's where a lot of, a lot of um, you know, controversy comes up. Because we see things like the flood. I'm not the flood, the, the tsunami. Yeah. You know, we see things like disaster, natural disasters in places and, and plagues and pestilence and things like that. And we're kind of reluctant to say God might have a hand in that. But guess what? God might have a hand in that because the Bible says he's revealing his wrath against unrighteousness even today. He's not just sitting on a cloud somewhere waiting for man to come around. He's actively involved in what's going on in many ways. So the Bible says he re revealed his wrath in the past. He's revealing his wrath against unrighteousness today. Sometimes I think maybe some of these diseases that people have, these STDs and AIDS and things, and, you know, I don't know. Maybe. But I'm convinced that uh, we're, we're, we're feeling it and going to feel it in America. Yeah, we're, uh, we're kind of suffering here a little bit in some ways uh, in America. Um, not as much as the rest of the world, perhaps. Maybe some of the countries that are under Islamic um, terrorism and, and uh, control. Uh, it might be some of, some of God's wrath being poured out. I don't know. I'm just saying, the Bible says he pours out his wrath even today. How about the future? What's in store for the future? Tribulation. Yeah, we got the tribulation coming. We've got the return of Jesus to the earth. We've got the great white throne judgment. So God is actively involved in revealing his wrath against all ungodliness and unrighteousness in this world. And that goes on as evidence of the fact that man is lost. So we can look at the Bible and see that. Now, how about evidence from creation? Here's another item that Paul offers. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay, so who's the they he's talking about here, do you think? Us, right? Mankind. He's offering evidence as to why man is unrighteous. Now, we can look out on the world today. and We can see the beautiful stars. We can see the immense expanse of the universe. And the Bible says that God's creation is actually a testimony to his power and glory. And we can actually look out. And so for someone to say, well, I didn't know about God, God is saying, that's not true. He said, all you got to do is look out at the stars. You know, Psalm 19 says that. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows forth his handiwork. Day after day, night after night, they, they speak knowledge to the earth. So really, man's got no excuse in terms of not knowing about God. So what did man do with this knowledge? Remember, we're talking about from the Garden of Eden on. They knew about God. They saw the angel guarding the Garden of Eden. You know, what's interesting to me is that when God created the Garden of Eden and kicked Adam and Eve out, who did he place to keep man from going back in the Garden of Eden? Stannis says an angel. He placed an angel. And what did that angel have in his hand? 
They had a sword. And that was to keep anybody from coming back into the Garden of Eden. Because what was in the Garden of Eden that they weren't allowed to get to? Tree of Life was in there. And they did not want man back in. God did not want man back in eating of the Tree of Life and remaining in a perpetual state of sinfulness. So he put an angel there. How long do you think that angel stayed there? <laughs> I guess he probably would have been. Stana says, wouldn't he still be there? I guess he probably would have been had it not been for some event that wiped everything out. The flood came. I'm of the opinion that angel stood guard there until the flood because there's no way that God would have allowed man to go back in the Garden of Eden. And it doesn't say the Garden of Eden went anywhere. It said man walked away from God. So man not only had a knowledge of God, he had a visual representation of God with an angel guarding the Garden of Eden. I think that was never documents there. when that guy left. Huh? The Bible never documents when no. that angel quit his job. It didn't. got reassigned or whatever. It didn't? It doesn't, say, it doesn't say the Garden of Eden just disappeared or anything. I, I'm of the opinion that he stood there guard, guarding that thing until God wiped out the, the earth in the flood. Yeah, so God said, okay, if you relieve the Yeah. Because here's the thing. God always has had a witness on the earth. We're going to talk about that a little bit. What about people that have never heard about God? Is it fair to God for God to condemn people as unrighteous? If they've never heard about God. Truth is, they have. God's always had a witness on the earth. And it's interesting how missionaries go out and encounter some of these tribes that supposedly are in the deepest, darkest places of Africa or deepest, darkest jungles. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. Oh, I'm sorry, you were... That verse right there, uh -huh. Psalm 9, or Romans 120. Right here? That's it. They're clearly seen. They're without excuse. Yeah. So what did God, what did man do with this knowledge? Well, look at um, verses 21 through 23. It's 21 through 23 tells us, What man did with this knowledge? It says, because although they knew God. Now this is interesting. It didn't say they knew about God. It said they knew God. This is the early record of man's existence on the earth, probably after the fall and before the flood on the earth. They knew God. God was active on the earth. The angel was there. They did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creepy things. What did man do with the knowledge of God that he had? He corrupted it. Uh, he made it science. <laughs> came up with the, came up with evolution. No, said God's a bug. God's a frog. God's a big disc in the sky. God's whatever you want it to be. God's whatever you want it to be. Instead of no doing what they knew to be true, they turned from it and decided no. Nope. And that is the record we have. How about today? What's man doing with the, this knowledge of God? It hasn't gone away. We still have it. Same thing. Corrupted. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Instead of worshiping a frog, we came from an amoeba. You know, we're going to worship the monkey, the, the chimpanzee, the half man, half ape transitional period, or we're going to worship science. Worship the cows. They worship cows in India. Yeah, they do. There's nothing changed, is what Paul's saying. He's like, hey, this is what they were back then. This is what we are today. It's pretty good evidence that God is saying what God is saying about our particular condition before God is pretty accurate. There's none good. All right, well, I don't worship a cow. I didn't even before I was a Christian, right? Um, so maybe, maybe this doesn't apply to me. I believed in God before I was saved. So maybe I'm not as bad as he's saying. Well, this um, <laughs> yeah, I jumped farther than Catalina than the guy behind me. 
That's right. But I didn't make it to Catalina. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what about those who have never heard about Jesus? Now, we've talked about, you know, people and their knowledge of God and turned away from God. And over time, they stopped really talking about God. And so then you have these rotten Hottentots in, in Africa running around. And is God just to hold the rotten Hottentots accountable if they've never heard the gospel? You might have might have had a question like that in your own mind. I mean, what about the heathen out there that never heard about Jesus? Never heard about God? Never heard about um, salvation through faith? What about them? In fact, someone once said that man is incurably religious because God has put a knowledge of him in their hearts. And so man is always seeking a higher being. Yes? Isn't there scripture that states that, that God has put it in our hearts to know that he exists? We are, and we're going to get to that as part of Paul's evidences. Right now, Paul is talking about creation, and he's talking about what men can see, men and women can see just around them that points to God. And you're right. The Bible says, and human experience says, that man wants to connect to a higher Authority, and even when you go to um, pe people groups that have um, religions of idolatry, there's usually, even in that, a great spirit. There's always one spirit that's bigger than everybody else. And everything originates from that one spirit. It's interesting that when missionaries go out and deal with tribal groups that have never heard the gospel, they, s they encounter concepts that are biblical in among these people. Um, I remember a story. I was a gentleman by the name of Don Richardson. Don Richardson was a missionary. And he was in, I think, the 50s, maybe early 60s. And his, his um, mission field was actually Papua New Guinea, which is a, an island, I think, off of New Zealand, near New Zealand, Australia area. But Papua New Guinea happened to be a very, very rugged and remote place. One of the last real frontiers uh, uh, for missionary work on the earth because they had cannibals there. That's where the cannibals were. And the uh, missionaries would go there. And fortunately, the cannibals didn't eat the missionaries. What they would do is they would fight amongst themselves and they would eat their um, the one they defeat. And they did that because it's, they, they thought it gave them power. So Don Richardson went out as a missionary to deal with the Indians in Papua New Guinea, the, the natives there. And he um, camped himself in one of the tribes. And this particular tribe he was with had an ongoing battle, a war, with another tribe. And it had been going on for generations. Generation after generation, they would go and fight each other and capture the people and kill them and eat them. And then that guy would get eaten over there. This guy would be eaten over here. And pretty soon, one of the, the kings, one of the chiefs, said, you know, if we don't stop this, we're just going to kill each other off. And then there won't be anybody. So he came up with a plan. He said, we're going to have a powwow with this other tribe. And so he brought the tribe in, the chiefs from the other tribe, and said, look, let's do this. Let's stop killing each other. And as a token, we're going to offer a child, a baby, as an atonement. And our child will live in your camp, and you give us a child to live in our camp. And those children living in the opposing camps would be adopted and become part of that tribe, and that would be a peace child. The tribe giving a child as an atonement and bring peace. And when Don Richardson heard this concept in the, in, the, in the tribes, he was amazed because that's exactly what God did for us. He sent his son. And it was actually the door that opened up the gospel to these tribes because he told them, just as you have done this, God has done that for you. And it's really amazing how much um, knowledge is found in a lot of these remote places. Because God has always had a witness. In fact, um, I wrote down some I wrote down some things God says about the heathen. He said about what? 
the heathen, the lost, you know, the people that have never heard the gospel. This is what God says. He says he instructs the heathen. He rebukes the heathen. He reigns over them. He judges them. He confounds their ways. He chastens them. He visits them. He teaches them. Psalm 98 1 says he makes known his salvation to the heathen. And he justifies them by faith. And so there's a lot that God is doing in creation, in the world. God's not sitting back and just letting things go their own way. Even though man is lost, he's still operating within the realm of the heathen. And so when Fred says, you know, they have it in their heart, you know, if they want to know God. You know, I kind of think that, you know, if a person wanted to be saved and they hadn't heard about Jesus, but if a person wanted to know God, do you think God would make it possible for that person to hear? I think he would. I mean, look at the Old Testament saints, right? Yeah, look at the Old Testament saints. How about Enoch? I know Adam and Eve walked with God, so they had an... What about Enoch? It says he walked with God and God took him up. You know? How about Noah? How did Noah learn? Jesus wasn't there. But he got saved, right? Abraham, same thing. I think if a person, no matter who they are on the earth, wanted to know more about the Creator and really sought in his heart to know the truth, I really believe that God would figure out a way to make that happen. In Romans 10.13, what does Romans 10.13 say? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. A person calls out to God and says, you know, I don't believe all this frog and snake stuff. I know there's something more than that up there. I think God will reveal himself to him. Galatians chapter 3 says the same thing. It said he preached the gospel to Abraham. Before Jesus was even born, Abraham heard the gospel. And it was, in fact, let me read Galatians 3, 6 through 8. Says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. See, Abraham believed God. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham. Now when did God preach the gospel to Abraham? Notice what it says. Saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. He didn't mention the name Jesus. He just told Abraham, there's one coming who's going to bless the nations. Abraham believed that, and he was saved. That was the gospel to Abraham. The Bible says it was actually preached to Abraham. So what we're saying here is simply that God will make a way to allow a person to understand and exercise faith if they want to know God. I believe that. So God's not sitting around doing nothing when it comes to the the heathen. Okay, so. So we have evidence from creation. We have evidence from. What did I say? Evidence from creation. Evidence from. Um, yeah, evidence from creation. Now we have evidence from man's passions. Paul brings out another line of evidence. Let's take a look at verses 26 and 27. What evidence does Paul present to show man's passions, declare them unrighteous? Let's take a look at verses 26 and 27 of Romans. So, from creation, they could know God, but they turned away from God, and this caused a result. And the result is, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Roman men were free to enjoy sex with other males without any perceived loss of masculinity or social status, as long as they took the dominant role. 
So it was sort of an open thing in Rome. You could choose whoever. And acceptable male partners was nor were normally slaves or former slaves. It's prostitutes, entertainers whose lifestyle placed them in the nebulous social realm of infamia, um, excluded from normal protections according to a citizen, even if they were technically free. So Roman slaves oftentimes ended up being the targets for this type of behavior. So in Rome, in the church in Rome, they were probably very familiar with this and probably didn't appreciate it too much. And so Paul used this particular uh, example, I think, sort of to drive home the point. It would have been a very poignant point for many of these Roman slaves who are now Christian. And they could say a hearty amen to the unrighteousness of man. And so Paul says man's passions. We see it all around us every day. Well, how about evidence for man's moral behavior? Now Paul goes on, offers some more evidence. In Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 32, here's the evidence from man's moral behavior. Paul says, look out at the world. Look out at the people you rub shoulders with. Look out at the headlines on the newspaper, the evening news. Look out at what you guard yourself from, how you protect yourself. What are you protecting yourself from normally is other people's bad behavior. Covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Not a nice list. But it could be the headlines on any day's newspaper. Any one of them. They'll do them. It's weak. Yeah. Ignorant, evil people we are. But not even ignorant, but not so ignorant and still do it anyway. Yes. Absolutely. Does Paul have a point? Yeah. Yeah, he has a point. We are all gone. It's like sheep without a shepherd. Yeah. So let's take a look at some of these words. First of all, shameful human behavior. We're just going to read some of the guides on page 57 and 58. Let's just read some of this here. These are just um, words that define the shameful human behavior. It says things like unrighteousness, which means injustice, wickedness, depravity, iniquity, evil purposes and designs, covetousness, sometimes translated by the word greed, maliciousness, a disposition to injury and revenge, gossip, Desire to do harm to other people, full of envy, byproduct of greed, deceit, word that means fish bait, and ultimately meant to mean to lure, ensnare, beguile, or to deceive. Evil mindedness, bad character, depravity of heart and mind, haters of God. Are there haters of God out there today? Yeah, there are. Gee, it's getting worse too. Violent. That's the one thing that it really cracks me up. Not cracking me up, but I was, <laughs> I was, I was getting my hair cut down in Algodonas, and they always have this one show on, and it's a Mexican show about. It's called Passion, I think. It's a uh, soap opera. Soap operas. In, in Spanish. Yeah, in Spanish, and, and so. You're enjoying watching it. No, no, I wasn't enjoying watching it. I was interested in watching it because I'm getting my hair cut and I can't understand what they're saying on the show but I was watching just watching things and there would be like a show and while I'm there you know maybe there'd be two shows one after and I'd catch the end of one and the start of another one and any, anyway I've been there a few times and there have been different shows on as I've been watching it but every show they're either fighting 
or kissing. <laughs> they're either just doing all kinds of lustful stuff, or they're, they're fighting, and, and that's the whole show. And I'm thinking, well, is that all there is to these shows? That's what Man, people watch. It hasn't changed much. You know, I'm like, I'm like watching this stuff, and I'm going, like, this is nuts. Like, but, yet, but yet, when we go to the movies or we watch TV shows or whatever, I mean, what are we watching? Usually not Hallmark, it's probably some, you know, I like watching forensic files. So I'm watching people murdering people, and I'm, you know, I'm not enjoying the murder, I'm enjoying them getting caught, but I'm fascinated by how they do that. But all our shows, a lot of times we watch shows, we watch soap operas, what are they talking about? What are they doing in this show? It's all this stuff. But anyway, that's what the world is, right? That's what we're looking at. Violent, proud, undiscerning, unloving, untrustworthy, unmerciful, yeah. And then... Shameful human conduct, not just their, their character, but the, the results of their, their character. Murder, disobedient to parents. This to me, man is all of mankind. He's not at all. His creation. Anything that really hasn't changed. No, we haven't. In fact, take a look at 2 Timothy 3.1. No, look at, look at 2 Timothy 3.1. Who's 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Timothy 3, 1. He says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Sl Wait a minute, we just read all that in Romans chapter 1. Yes. <laughs> Burn. Satan doesn't have to sin. He gets a new generation all the time. He does. He just the gets same the same thing out. comes out, right? That's right. Slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. It's the same old, same old, same story. What do they say? Uh, same verse, new song, or same song, second verse, or something. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. You know. Same thing. So, really, nothing's changed. You know, we... Man looking, man, Paul says, all you got to do is look at, look at the history of the world. Look at what's happened since creation. Man's judgment against God. Man's disobedience to God. Man's turning away from God. And that's all of us. That's not just bad people. And that's not just savage people. That's every one of us, right? So I think so far Paul's proven his point. He hasn't gotten to the religious people yet. These are all just the people that are, that are out there. But what about the righteous, the religious people? What about the people that go to church and carry a big Bible? And... They're worse. <laughs> they're worse. Status says they're worse. Okay, so from what we've learned, what would you say to someone that believes God is unfair for judging people who never heard about the gospel? It's not true. It's not true. Everybody's heard, huh? The Bible says they're without excuse. Bible says that if someone wanted to know about God, God would let them know. Especially in this country. Especially in this, country. Especially in this uh, time in the world with the internet and education. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they were saying um, back in the turn of the century, 1900s, let's say. 1900s knowledge doubled every 30 years in the world as people found out new discoveries and things in the 1900s. It might have been 50, every, every uh, 50 years knowledge doubles. Guess what it is today? <laughs> A couple minutes. <laughs> the amount of information that's the, and discoveries and, and things that, that weren't known about before it's the information and the information that's available to people is like doubling every 10 minutes. So really, there's not someone who hasn't heard. You know, everybody has a knowledge of God at some point, at some level. And the Bible says that they've turned away from it or whatever. A lot of them have turned away from whatever level it is. And that, that's, that's, that's sad. But 
How does God redeem people who haven't heard about Jesus? The same as he redeems everybody else. I mean, we all are without excuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's by faith. By grace. By grace, through faith. And it's usually to the knowledge that they have. If a person wants to know God, God says, I'll get that knowledge to him. I'll get that information to him. He's not hiding. No, he's not hiding at all. Yeah, but there's some dangers to that too. So, so far, Paul's talked about evidence from creation. He's talked about evidence from man's passion. Uh, next time, we're going to talk about people that have religion. What about religious people? Are they lost too? Doesn't their religion help? Uh, we're going to find out. So we'll stop there. We started a little early, so.